Hearing loss is not a problem of the ears. You got it right. It's actually a problem of the brain. What doesn't get through the ears doesn't get to the brain. And that's what we learned from researchers like Dr. Carol Flexer and Dr. Teresa Carraway. So let's talk about how hearing really works and how the ear works. When someone says the word hello, it's caught by this outer ear. It travels down the ear canal and runs into the eardrum, which it moves back and forth. The vibration of the eardrum moves the three smallest bones in the human body. We typically refer to them as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Once those three bones are in motion, they push on a tiny window of tissue, and on the other side of that tissue is fluid. The fluid is contained in the cochlea, a C-shell shaped structure. Inside that fluid and inside the cochlea are tiny hair cells. When the fluid runs over the top of the hair cells, it stimulates the eighth cranial nerve, and that's the nerve that goes to the brain. And once it reaches the brain, the brain hears, hello. That's how normal hearing works. But if there's an interruption of this process at any time, if any of these structures are not working, then sound is not going to get to the brain. Let's do something together we do all the time in school. Let's take a spelling test. But during this spelling test, we're going to simulate a hearing loss. So don't adjust the volume on your computer. OK, here are your words. Ready? Number one, fill. Number two, cat. Number three, thumb. Number four, heap. Number five, wide. How'd you do? Chances are you missed some of the words because you couldn't hear them all. Here are the words again so you know what they were. Correct your paper. Number one, fill. Number two, catch. Number three, thumb. Number four, heap. Number five, wise. Let's think about what you could hear. Chances are you could hear the vowels. Vowels are louder. They carry more energy when we speak. But the consonants probably gave you more difficulty. Consonants are softer, quieter, and harder to hear. The problem about consonants is they carry a whole lot of information in the English language. Think about these words. Bat, mat, cat, fat, sat, that. All of those words have different meanings and all I did was change one consonant in them. What about grammar? Sure, the plural s or the ed past tense. Those are just made by consonants and they're very difficult to hear. So students who can't hear them are going to struggle with language and literacy. Here's another simulation for you. This one's visual. I'm showing you a small word. That's because I want you to think that it's quiet. Let's put hearing aids on you and amplify that sound. Maybe that will help you to hear it. Any better? Not really. And that's because hearing aids can make a sound louder but they cannot clarify it if there's any distortion or any missing information. So they have limitations. Let's think about putting a hearing aid on a child in a classroom. It solves some of our problems, but not all of them. Let me explain. Here's an audiogram. It's the chart that audiologists use when they graph your hearing. You know, you raise your hand when you hear the tone. At the top of the chart, and at the bottom of the chart are painfully loud sounds. On the left side of the chart are low pitch sounds, and on the right side are the very high pitch sounds. In the middle you see a yellow boomerang. People often call that the speech banana. And inside that yellow area are all the sounds of the English language. You'll see that they come down to about 60 decibels. That's the range of conversational speech. Now when you plot someone's hearing, when you raise your hand, the red line indicates the right ear. The blue line is the left ear. You can hear what's below that sound. 
So an analogy I like to use is that of a window and a window blind. When you pull the blinds down, you can see what comes in under the blind. You can see the sunlight, cars, trees, whatever's outside. But you can't see what's behind that blind. It's the same thing with this audiogram. You can hear what's coming in below those lines, but you can't hear what's coming in above them. You've pulled the blind down on it. A hearing aid, that's good news to us because what that does is it lifts the blind and it gives us access to all the sounds of speech. So if this is a student in your classroom and they're only hearing what's below those lines, they're missing half of what you're saying to them, half of the sounds of the English language. The good news is, if we put a hearing aid on that child, they now will have access to all the sounds of speech, and they'll be able to hear you. If you stand within about three feet of them, think arm's length. If you're within that distance from your student, their hearing aid will effectively pick up what you're saying. When you get further than arm's reach from them, that hearing aid is not going to effectively pick up your speech and they're not going to hear you. So distance is a problem and so is background noise. I said conversational speech is about 60 decibels, but guess what? So is classroom noise. Even in a well-managed classroom with students on task and doing what they're supposed to be doing, the noise of 20 bodies in a classroom, sneezing, shuffling papers, moving chairs, a hamster, uh, an air conditioner blowing in the background, all of that creates background noise. And now that student's hearing aid is not going to be able to pick up your voice louder than the background noise. The good news is we have classroom amplification systems that we can use for that situation. They combat the effects of distance and noise. Ultimately, we want students to learn. And if they can only hear a percentage of what you're saying, their learning is going to be vastly limited. Find out what you can do to help bring accommodations to the students you have in your classroom who have a hearing loss.